August 11. The Holy Martyr Euplus Euplus was a deacon in Catania, Sicily. Emperor Diocletian dispatched the Roman commander Pentagoras to Sicily to exterminate any Christians he found there. Pentagoras did not find a single Christian, for the few that were there hid from the persecutor and did not reveal themselves. Even so, someone accused Euplus of taking a book to secret Christians and reading to them. This book was the Holy Gospel. They soon brought him to court, hung that book around his neck and led him to prison. After seven days of imprisonment and hunger, Euplus was given over for torture. While they were beating him with iron rods, Euplus mockingly said to the torturing judge, O ignorant one, do you not see that, by God's grace, these tortures are like a cobweb to me? If you can find other harsher tortures, for all of these are us toys. After more of the same, they led the martyr of Christ to the scaffold. There St. Euplus opened the Holy Gospel and read from it to the people for a long time. Many converted to the Christian faith. St. Euplus was beheaded in the year 304 AD and took up his habitation in the kingdom of heaven. His miracle working relics repose in a village near Napl Naples called Vico de la Batonia. The holy female martyr Susanna the Virgin and others with her. Susanna was the daughter of a Roman presbyter, Gabinus, and a niece of Pope Gaius. Gaius and Gabinus were of royal lineage and kinsmen to the then ruling Emperor Diocletian. Emperor Diocletian had an adopted son, Maximian Galerius, whom he, Diocletian, wanted to marry Susanna. Susanna, completely dedicated to Christ the Lord, did not even want to consider marriage, and particularly not marriage with an unbaptized man. The aristocrats Claudius and Maximus had been pressuring her to marry the emperor's son, but Susanna converted them and their entire household to the Christian faith. Enraged by this, the emperor ordered that the executioners take Claudius, Maximus and their household to Ostia, where they burned them alive and threw their ashes into the sea. Susanna was beheaded in the home of her father Gabinus. The emperor's wife Serena, secretly a Christian, removed Susanna's martyr body under cover of night and honorably buried it. Pope Gaius converted Gabinus's house into a church and celebrated services there, since there was a place where the young martyr Susanna was slain. Shortly following the sufferings of this Bride of Christ, her father Presbyter Gabinus and her uncle Pope Gaius also suffered. Susanna, her father and her uncle suffered honorably for the Lord and received their writs of glory in the years 295 and 296 AD. St. Niphon, Patriarch of Constantinople Niphon was born in Greece. He was tonsured a monk in his youth and lived a life of asceticism, eventually making his way to Mount Athos. He practiced asceticism in various monasteries, remaining the longest in the Vatopedi and Dionysium. He was loved by all the holy Athonite fathers, as much for his rare wisdom as for the unusual meekness. He was consecrated Bishop of Thessalonica against his will. And then two years later, he journeyed to Constantinople on business, where he was elected to the vacant patriarchal throne. Eventually, the Sultan banished him to Jedrin, where he lived in exile. The Wallachian Romanian Prince Radu besought him from the Sultan and named Nifon the Archbishop of the Wallachian people. Then, because of Radu's transgressions, Nifon departed Valachia and returned to Mount Athos, to the monastery of Dionysium. 
There he lived the life of asceticism until his 90th year, when he took up his habitation in the kingdom of God. He reposed in the year 1460 AD. He composed the prayer of absolution read at the burial service. The Venerable Basil and Theodore of the Monastery of the Caves in Kiev Both Basil and Theodore died by violence at the hands of the avaricious, money-loving Prince Istislav in the year 1098 AD. The hagiography of Saint Theodore is especially instructive for the avaricious. Theodore was very wealthy but distributed all of his wealth to the poor and was tonsured a monk. After that he repented of his charity and grieved for his wealth, being greatly tempted by all the evil spirits of avarice, from which Saint Basil freed him. Reflection If a man sets off on the path of righteousness, he should walk only on the path of righteousness, keeping both feet on the path. He should not step one foot on the righteous path and the other on the unrighteous path. For through the prophet, God spoke thus about the righteous who commit unrighteousness. All his righteousness that he has done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he has trespassed, and in his sins that he has sinned, in them shall he die. Ezekiel 18.24 The Wallachian prince Radu was a just man and performed many good deeds. He brought Saint Nephon out of his bondage in Jedrin and made him the Archbishop of Bucharest. Unexpectedly, Radu committed a dreadful transgression. He gave his sister to be the wife of the corrupt prince Bogdan of Moldavia, while Bogdan's wife was still alive. Radu did not heed the protest of Nifon. Nifon prophesied an evil end for Radu and publicly excommunicated him from the church. Then he departed for Valachia. Shortly thereafter there was a drought and a great famine in Valachia and Radu fell into an incurable illness whereby his entire body was covered with sores and because of his putrefying stench, no one could bear to approach him. When Radu was buried, his grave shook for three days, as once did the grave of Empress Sudoxia, the persecutor of St. John Chrysostom. Contemplation to contemplate the self-will of the Jewish people, 1 Samuel 8, also known as 1 Kings 8. How the Jews besought Samuel to appoint a king for them. How Samuel protested this in the name of the Lord, who proclaimed that he is the only king. How the people remained stubborn, rejecting the will of God and the counsel of Samuel. God and the counsel of Samuel. Homily. Instead of sweet smell, there shall be sting, and instead of a girdle, a rent, and instead of well set hair, baldness, and burning instead of beauty. Isaiah 3.24 These are the words about extravagant and wayward women, about the daughters of Zion who have become haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Isaiah 3.16 What was it that made a Hebrew woman proud? Was it virtue? Virtue never made anyone proud, for virtue is in fact a cure against pride. Was it the strength of a people and the stability of the state? No, on the contrary, the prophet precisely foretells the imminent bondage of the people and the destruction of the state and the prophet cites vain extravagance, spiritual vanity, and wayward woman as the main causes of slavery and destruction. 
What therefore made them so proud and haughty? Ornaments and embroideries, strong beads and necklaces, trinkets and hairpins, garters and cinctures, perfumes and rings, seductive fluttering and mirrors. Behold, this is what made them proud and haughty. It is all an expression of their ignorant pride, but the true cause of their pride is spiritual perversity. From spiritual vanity comes pride, and that external melange mixture of colors that women drape over their bodies is only an obvious manifestation of their ignorant pride. What will become of all this in the end? Stench, disintegration, boldness and burning. This will occur when the people fall into bondage. As it usually happens, the spirit is enslaved by the body, then the body is enslaved by an external enemy. Thus will be the case when the inescapable fate of even the most beautiful, the most healthy, the most wealthy and the most extravagant woman. But this is not the greatest misfortune. The greatest misfortune is that the souls of this woman with their stench, dishevelness, boldness and burning will come before God and the heavenly hosts of the most beautiful of God's angels and righteous ones. Here the stench of the body denotes the stench that depravity and vice leaves in the soul. A disheveled body denotes the insatiability of the soul for bodily pleasures. Physical boldness denotes the nakedness of a soul devoid of good works and pure thoughts. And the burning of the body denotes the burning of a tortured conscience and an inflamed mind. Oh, how dreadful is the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. It was dreadful then, and it is dreadful even today. Dreadful because it is true. O oh, holy and most pure Lord, help the women who make the sign of your cross, that they may remember their souls and cleanse their souls before your righteous judgment, so that their souls together with their bodies do not become eternal stench. To thee be glory and praise forever. Amen.